Hello everyone, welcome to Rural Water Resource Management course, which is the MPTL course focusing on rural water issues and how to manage them. This is week seven and we are at lecture three. In this week, we have been looking at the water balance equation, how to construct one, what are the data that gets into the equation and today we'll be looking at more specifics on how to solve issues and concerns using the water balance equation. Also, some important concepts will be discussed. The first one is of course, the units for water balance. Because most of the time, the complex equation would have different water resources, for example, groundwater, rainfall, infiltration, etc. These units might be procured or assumed or estimated from a different entity. For example, ET, we take the crop growth and then using the crop growth, crop coefficient, we understand how much water is needed. And these might trigger a difference in units. So you need to be very careful to normalize across the equation with a single unit. Let's take our example for today. The water balance equation that we have been seeing, which is del S, the storage or change in storage. The P, which is your precipitation. Here, we are only looking at rainfall to keep it simple. Qs are the runoff, discharge coming in and discharge going out. Your ET, which is the plant consumption. The groundwater in and groundwater out, which is given by G. The units need to be consistent. Otherwise, we'll be comparing apples and oranges, which means if the units are different, your del S might be too small, minuscule, or too big, which cannot happen. We've seen a lot of works that have not normalized, and by that time, the data has been published. So be very careful to have the exact units across, not only the quantity of the unit, but also the time, which means what is the unit of time that has been discussed. When I say del S, del S across what? Is it a day, is it an hour, or is it a month or annual? So you can pick any day, any time that um, goes into your equation, but keep that time consistent, just between seconds and a year, just between seconds and an hour, you see the unit can change, your magnitude can change multiple times if you use the wrong unit. Usually a rate per unit time, but it's not explicitly given here. For example, when you write it, most people would write del S as millimeters, precipitation as millimeters, Q in millimeters, Q out millimeters, ET, G, G out millimeters. Because when we define the water balance equation somewhere, the author would have defined it as water balance annual or daily water balance. So sometimes your unit of time is implicit. It's not as explicit as your parameters. P is rainfall millimeters or inches. Okay. So be careful to understand the unit when you have seen the water balance equation. It's always good to go back and check are they doing it correctly? Is it, is it correctly uh, what you want? Okay. If time is common across, it may not be explicitly included. As I mentioned, if time is the only uh, unit across, they won't put millimeters per year because annually they have defined. Let's take an example for water balance. Here, where is the time? It is implicit, which means you have the time here as months. So you have a total of 12 months for a particular year. Okay, so you have a particular year and you've taken 12 months and monthly, these are the parameters values. And for our equation, we have EPT, which is your evapotranspiration uh, together with potential. Okay, 
and then your P, which is your rainfall, which is ET, which is your actual uh, evapotranspiration. And then SMU, we had it as soil moisture deficit uh, with SMD and uh, soil moisture utilization with SMU, uh, actual soil moisture or storage, et cetera, et cetera. We'll not get into the units of these, or what they actually mean, because this is for showing the example of how the units are the same across the ED, which is a measure of water getting into the plant and transpiring consumption, which converts into a gaseous phase and goes up is in millimeters. So think about this, the phase would also change. The precipitation, which is your rainfall is in millimeters. You have a tube, you can measure it, but your ET, which is in a gaseous phase is also measured as a thickness millimeters, not as a volume. Okay. Similarly, your ice, for example, if it's a solid, you say soil uh, water coming from your snow melt, which is actually initially was a snow thickness. So you have a millimeter of snow thickness, which converts to runoff, which converts to soil moisture. So to keep that flow uniform, the unit has been kept uniform across the table. And as I said, you will not have a unit explicitly mentioned if it is a common unit. Here it is month. The quick question is, what was this unit for time? If you think about it, the months have been totaled, which means added. So all the months have been summed up. So this is the sum of all EPT and sum of all your rainfall, your actual ED, et cetera, et cetera. What you see here is the total is an annual time step, which means the unit time is annual per year. It is not per month as you see here. Okay. So let it keep it across and then uh, we will see how things rearrange, et cetera. Just for the quick analysis, let's do a quick uh, seeing what this actually means, this water balance, right? So you have total 1375 millimeters per year, which is the total uh, water a plant needs in a hygienic or good condition, which is like uh, unlimited water supply for good growth. Okay, But the actual precipitation is only 1134. And out of the 1134, which is lesser than your plant requirement, not all water is being taken up because some runoff, some go to evaporation on the site, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So you have only 952. Okay, so 952 minus P gives you your actual SMU, which is soil moisture utilization. How much uh, unused or uh, kept in it and the deficit. Okay, so coming back, deficit is just these two numbers because you have the potential ED, which is the highest, but the actual ED is much lesser. Okay, so you could now use a water balance approach to identify what is the soil moisture use, what is the soil moisture deficit, how much should I augment, or how much water should my groundwater be supplied. This exercise could have been only possible by first normalizing your uh, parameters on a specific unit and also normalizing it on a time unit. You cannot have January for uh, monthly for uh, EPT, and for this example, January, uh, and then keep it annual for precipitation. Okay, it cannot be done. If you have only annual, what do you do? Like the least common denominator approach, you just come back here and say, okay, what is the smallest time that is across the series, which is same. For here, if you say precipitation is in annual, then you have to sum everything and only look at this column and row. Okay, only the total column and row should be taken up because precipitation is in annual. But here we have the division, so we kept it. If you don't have it, in some cases you may not have it. So be careful on just using the annual so you can sum it up, but don't divide your rainfall by 12 and put it here. It is not correct. Because for January, you cannot put uh, an average rainfall which is divided from your total rainfall. Okay, so keep your rainfall. Look at it; it starts very low and then goes up and comes down. All these are tied with the plant growth. 
and the circulation of climate. So here, keep it uh, at annual scale if that is the least common time frame that agrees across your parameters. Moving on, need to source data from multiple organizations. This is another issue or concern. Based on the equations complexity, you may have to get data from different organizations. This happens across the world. It's not only in India or rural sectors. Wherever you go, you will have different agencies monitoring different data. To bring them together, we need to work on some mechanisms or the user has to maintain a table of data and source and pick each source of data and reorganize the units, both the time and the actual quantities parameters unit. Let's take an example for Indian case, the surface water, which is your discharge runoff is monitored by the Central Water Commission, which is a CWC. However, the groundwater is monitored by the CGWB, Central Groundwater Board. In some cases, we have the government data. Okay, so IMD is monitoring your uh, rainfall data, uh, which is also government, all the government agencies. And then there's a government agency which monitors remote sensing data. And the remote sensing can be of groundwater, of surface water, rainfall, ET, you can name it. I'm only naming the parameters for your water balance equation. Okay, so it is it is very important to understand these units and understand the source. There could be some errors in the source which you need to incorporate, especially for remote sensing data. Uh, they will give you some parameters that you need to incorporate to get the final output. Uh, so that is also important to read about the data before you incorporate into your water balance equation. Read the source, the methodology, how the data is collected, the units for the actual quantity as in millimeters or inches or foot and the time frame which was collected. The timestamp temporal resolution we call, is it per day, per hour, per month, etc. For example, rainfalls can be collected per day. So what you should do is in the IMD portal, when you download the data, you should say, no, I want it as a monthly so that it automatically sums it and gives it to you. Otherwise, you will have to do it by downloading the data and then making sure you uh, use uh, your uh, tables to sum it up to the least common time frame. Remote sensing data uh, can be one single entity, but multiple data. So what you saw in surface water, groundwater, and also the state water department, which is the PWDs we call in India, have data in focused parameters. For example, CWC is surface water, CGWB is groundwater. But remote sensing units like NASA for the, uh, the global and US regions and ISRO for mostly Indian regions, you would find that the data of multiple parameters is kept as an archive in the database. Would it be able to replace the observation data? Not possible, uh, but you can work it together. So my point is make your equation, try to see if you can get observation data. Otherwise try to see if you can go to the field and collect data. The final step is if you cannot get the data from an organization, if you cannot go collect the data, maybe it's costly, time consuming, etc use remote sensing data. All these are accepted norms in the government because uh, ISRO is a government uh, data board. And you can see here how, uh, for example, a climatic event uh, progresses per day. So this is at uh, very hourly or, uh, or even sub minute levels. It runs, the time runs, and then you have the rainfall pattern emerging. So where the higher rainfall and millimeters, look at the units. So all of them are given in your remote sensing data. You have your legend, which gives you the units, which is millimeters. The color gives uh, red means, for example, is around 40 to uh, 60 uh, millimeters. And the unit is given here. So normally what do you do? You take it as an annual stamp, daily stamp, or three hourly stamp and do your calculations. Here you see the flooding, which is your surface water drainage water uh, or your discharge water. Uh, and you put that in your 
equation for R. You remember R we used for runoff. That is this data. If it comes too much, it is flooding. And so this data was taken for the August 2018 floods uh, in Kerala, which was a very devastating floods, 100 year flood in Kerala. And you can see the water level depth as meters. So look here very carefully. It is in meters. We need to convert to millimeters. If you find it very hard, I'll give you some tricks how to do the conversions, etc. Let's look at some central groundwater board estimate type of water balance equation. You have the annual uh, replenishable groundwater resource as 433 billion cubic meter. So in a millimeter you have, and now this is a volume. So you have a thickness and you have volume. The thickness uh, can be converted to a volume by just multiplying across the area. Okay. They would have some different methods. Please look at the source uh, and see how they estimated it. So the net annual groundwater availability is 398 billion cubic meters. Annual groundwater draft for irrigation domestic is 245 billion cubic meters, which is one of the biggest in the world. Uh, and it is the biggest uh, rank number one, highest consum consumption of groundwater. Uh, stage of groundwater development is 62%. So here, if the three variables are enough to set up a good groundwater, water balance. You have your annual 433 on one side, and then you have your net groundwater availability 398, and the use is 245. So what is the storage? 398 minus 245 could be the storage, and that's what gives you the 62%. Okay, And you can also understand from 433, only 398. So approximately 35 million cubic meters is not available but it gets replenished annually. So that could be the water that goes into the base flow, river, discharge, etc. So these uh, do give a clear picture. What if the units are not consistent? As I promised, I'll give you the tricks. Uh, go back and convert to a common unit. Uh, I would stick to SI uh, metric units uh, so that um, it is more commonly used uh, rather than the gallons and uh, foot per acre, those kind of conversions. Uh, convert to a common time unit, example, day, month, year. Most of these parameters are done monthly and then annually. Uh, from the month, you can take the seasonal, so which is very smart. You cannot do uh, a year and then come back to seasonal, right? Because the seasons, what is important? Your Rabi, your uh, Karif, which is your monsoon season, the Rabi, which is your non-monsoon, and then you have the winter crops. Sometimes the winter crops is clubbed with the Rabi. So you can have the two key ones for water irrigation as Kharif and Rabi season. If you cannot convert it manually and or through your uh, tabular format like Excel or uh, open source library, open office, etc., what you could do is use online open source tools. Just type it in Google uh, meters to uh, foot. Um, cubic meters to foot acre, it'll do it automatically. Do, do just check it out, but most of the time it is accurate. So do it. And these kind of handbooks or something that could be stuck on your uh, reading room when you're doing these calculations. These uh, conversions do help you arithmetically to think about these numbers, how they have been sourced. Uh, but most importantly, you should not be waste putting too much time on each and every conversion because sometimes you can do a small mistake uh, for example, you say to convert just multiply from centimeters to inches 0.394. If you just put 0 0.0394 in your computer uh, Excel, for example, then the whole table is gone. Okay, so be careful with these changes. Double check your work. Okay, and always compare randomly test one variable, put it in Google, and say, uh, for example, 50 millimeters into inches, test what it is, and then double check it. Always double check. And it's better you use metric units, not English units, because most of the data that you get from online open source is metric, not English. Okay, <clears throat> I'll tell you, uh, for example, cricket is in yards, but our uh, uh, road uh, length and the time to get is in kilometers. So you see how it's confusing. You can just keep it in meters. We don't call uh, 22 meters or 10 meters uh, for the cricket pitch. We say yards. We say in feet. feet foot for the height, okay? We could have just kept it in meters and centimeters like they use it for selection committees. Uh, so like that, just keep it in one, uh, which is very, very important for your water balance.
moving on uh, measurements and units for water balance let's take our example again when you do this example it is as important to also identify the area and unit of study this has to be the first that you should be doing okay then you look at your data availability units etc why did i bring it after is so that to give a clear picture of your units availabilities etc and pan uh, your area you could check for example i'm going to do it in chennai uh, and i would like to see what data sources are available in tamil nadu uh, and the government so that i could check if the data is available okay so that's why i started with the units uh, but then when you focus on your study area make sure the unit is taken first sometimes you have your area and you have different points of observation data not in your center for example this part is your area uh, of interest but the data is only available here and down so what normally people do is interpolate the data for example imb rainfall data so it is good to understand the data the units and then come back to your area of interest and this area should be very very carefully determined units have to be consistent again the units the area has to come commensurate with your area in your water balance so which you should go back here and check if you're using metric for length like meters centimeters use your areas for uh, as per your metric also which is square meters square kilometers etc don't jump back and forth square yards square feet uh, you, you do use acres right in in irrigation you see suddenly acres coming up and then hectares on one side so don't jump back and forth i normally use meters millimeters centimeters uh, kilometers uh, for length and then jump into kilometer square meter square millimeter square cubic meters by area and volume respectively so uh, volumes i use cubic meters area i use meter square and length meters velocity acceleration all in meters to keep it uniformly consistent then you can easily uh, divide or multiply uh, by 10 uh, magnitude orders to get into the other units the area of unit has to be determined and units have to be consistent large scale versus small scale please understand that if if uh, you go larger scale the probability of getting the data for your experiment is high you will have more options to get the data however if you have a smaller area it might limit your probability so make sure if you are okay for the small area and less data by interpolating or assume, assuming from other data for example there is no rainfall here and there's no rainfall here you're not going to have rainfall here right like some kind of assumptions that you can make depending on the distance you don't have kilometers but i'm saying if it is 100 meters this side of your area 100 meters this side of your area you have observation for rainfall you can carefully assume that this can also be zero so those kind of assumptions basins watershed plot scales etc we did discuss about basins what is a basin what is a watershed catchment are you going to those scales or are you doing a plot scale analysis be very careful and do uh, make these maps uh, gis is a very uh, good open source uh, tool to make these maps for your study areas and then collect the data uh, but i would i would very carefully uh, taking these examples from notebooks on um, if the data is available if so where is the data and then my watershed area can be mapped out measurements and units let's continue uh, can also be larger scales when estimates are available uh, it can also show a bigger and clearer picture however uh, if you do not have the data uh, then most probably people go above scale for example um, this is an annual precipitation map for 2008 that we prepared uh, and uh, within your district some uh, places do not have rain gauge for example i may not have a gauge here i may not have a rain gauge here but it can be extrapolated into the district boundary which imd also does to get an assumption of the rainfall and you could see clearly a pattern right this region is getting rainfall around 674 to 851 whereas this is the driest with 314 to 353 and then yellows and blues etc so your estimates if they are available if the data is available you can go to larger scale if it is uh, very focused and you're doing a field study it is better to locate a smaller watershed area 
for your study and data units. Similarly, such maps can be made for other parameters to visualize. See, this visualization is a very important technique to understand your water balance. So if I see uh, a map, which is a spatial representation of the data rather than an equation, I could quickly say that, okay, this is the driest region. Okay, and around the driest region is also having less rainfall. So somewhere here that less rainfall, but higher rainfall is on the south of Gujarat. So I can throw these uh, estimates or comments saying that South Gujarat has better rainfall because I visualized your data. Then I can do multiple data sets together to estimate the water balance and storage components. You can also do global water resource maps. For example, this map uh, has been done by uh, NASA uh, to show how the groundwater availability changes across the world. And you could see um, based on the drainage uh, areas, the basins, uh, they have done these maps and uh, you could see uh, centimeters equivalent of H2O. And you can see how it changes uh, per month uh, uh, annual uh, availabilities of groundwater resources. And you can see that, okay, red is mostly here and that is where it is more and more uh, dangerous, the, the water resources, etc. So you could club these with your other estimates, be it observation data, be it uh, your water availability data to get at an estimate, a clear estimate of where you want to take your water balance. Uh, how do you estimate unknown parameters? And also if it is at one length, you cannot estimate the unknown parameters. Are you okay to dismiss them as negligible? One such parameter is groundwater in versus groundwater out. Many equations you would see that groundwater in is assumed to be the groundwater out. So both of them can cancel. Uh, if it is a groundwater study, don't do that. Okay, because groundwater study is to estimate how much groundwater you're pumping and then looking at it in detail. So be careful with what your estimates are uh, and what is your objective of your study. So measurements and units, also the a unit for the area is always kept as a watershed. Uh, so most studies would keep the watershed boundary because it is easier uh, for estimating the input. Let's say example rainfall. Okay, in this equation, you will see rainfall uh, can be estimated very accurately uh, and how the rainfall combines into discharge very accurately through a watershed approach. If you do not have a watershed approach, it might be difficult because the conversion of rainfall to a runoff is based on elevations, uh, which also gives you the boundary of your watershed basin catchment. So understand the hydrology uh, flows through the physics uh, equations and also the principle of water flows from high potential to low potential. And here a watershed boundary captures that dynamics from a high potential to low potential. So all this could be managed within your watershed if you know these physics principles and these are driving your uh, watershed boundaries and area, et cetera, et cetera. So with this, I would like to conclude uh, today's lecture uh, and stress on the fact that units are very important for water balance. There are concerns that sometimes you may not have all the data for your water balance equations, for example, P, Q, et cetera, et cetera. So you are allowed to assume some uh, values for your input or output variables, but clearly mention them so that another study person or a researcher can understand how you got these values and is it credible depending on your limitations. Also, it is important to finalize a unit area for the study and normally it is a watershed approach or if you have more data, you can go for state, district, national, subcontinent, global, etc. And when you grow above a particular level, like for example, from watershed to nation, some of these parameters can cancel out and most of the time you won't have all the data. So. Be careful on picking the uh, unit for your study area and then based on the units also make sure you have all the data that is available for your study area and what are the parameter units available and from the parameter units try to estimate what is the time unit 
and keep the type common across, keep the parameter unit common across so that you have something to compare and estimate your change in storage. So we've uh, taken all these points and uh, I would like to conclude with this uh, lecture for important points on setting up a watershed water balance balance. Thank you.